appreciate the opportunity to share my story. Obviously, it's not an easy story to share. Uh, one of the most important things that I think a lot of people don't take into consideration is you always think it cannot happen to you. That was one of the first things that I thought of years and years and years ago, even when I was a teenager. I was watching a TV show, and there was a man beating on his wife, and I sat there in that chair, and I said, well, that'll never happen to me. I'll never sit there and let somebody beat on me like that. Well, several years later, many years later, I did allow that to happen. Did not allow it to happen on purpose, but because of mental problems during the abuse. Um, I'm going to try to share as much of it as I can with you, um, and just, I give God glory and honor and praise today because if it wasn't for him, I could not be standing before you today. I don't claim to be no famous speaker, I don't claim to be anything special, but I do love the Lord today, and he is responsible for my being here, and I thank him for that. I grew up in Hall Care, my cousin Connie is back here, her, her grandpa actually was called the mayor of Hall Care, so... It's a little small little community, a very rural area. And, uh, you know, I didn't learn a lot when I was growing up as far as what people were like. You know, you grow up in a, in a neighborhood where there's nothing but good people, good Christian people and, and all of that. And so I didn't learn a lot about the ways of life. I lived a very sheltered life. Um, was overweight still. You see that pretty much hasn't changed a whole lot. I've lost some weight. But, uh, you know, uh, I lived a pretty sheltered life. and. Uh, make some bad choices, but you know what? The first thing a lot of people need to realize is you live your life by the choices you make. And uh, all it takes is one bad choice to ruin the rest of your life. And I started out with bad choices in my life as far as school is concerned and, and this, that, and the other. I had a guy that I met, uh, because of low self-esteem uh, in childhood, uh, I met and married the first guy that I dated, which was the first mistake that I made one of the first mistakes that I made. Uh, I'm gonna fast forward on there. Didn't uh, last a long time, I lasted about eight years. After it didn't last for, uh, I had a six-year-old son, I had a son during that time. Um, I was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, one of the most important things in my life when I grew up as a child, my heart's desire was to be a housewife and a mother. Uh, I modeled my life after my mother. My mother was one of those stay-at-home moms. She got up at 4 o'clock in the morning to cook breakfast and everything for us before we went to school. <coughs> so I modeled my life after her, and that's what I always wanted to be. Well, sometimes, you know, we get in a hurry to make those choices that we want to be in life. We want to see those dreams come true, but we make bad choices along the way. I became a Christian at 16 years of age. But uh, just because you become a Christian or just because you're in church doesn't make you a child of God. No more than being in a garage makes you a car. So, I mean, one of the things is you have to learn to study and you have to learn to apply yourself every day in things that you do. Well, I went to, um, I had to get out and find a job after my husband and I separated. Uh, one of the things that I had prayed for a long time was that I, I would never have to see any of my children grow up in a broken home. That was my heart's desire. The hardest thing for me to do was to separate from this man. But... It, things came to it and we had to. Well, I had to move in with Daddy because things were not really going. Uh, I had lost my air conditioning in my car, in my house, and um, the I wasn't making the money that I needed to be out on my own. So me and my son had to move in with my parents. Well, I began to work at Walmart. I got a job at Walmart. And um, uh, I met this little guy. He was about, about my height, I guess, but he was real stocky built. One of your charmers, um, one of your people who just kind of love to charm women. Uh, after I met him, um, didn't take long before he was saying, man, my heart just skips a beat every time you walk through. Um, you know, I just, you're just so beautiful. I'm just giving me compliments, one compliment after another. Uh, before I knew it, he was asking me out for coffee. I could tell he was a little bit older than me. I was a little bit uncomfortable with that situation, but all the more, I still went ahead and went out for coffee with him. My daddy, by the way, once I started talking about him, uh, my daddy knew right off the bat. He said, Elon, don't even go have coffee with the guy. My daddy, you know how our parents are. They can usually see. Those that you love can see, can see you. They know who you are. So the first thing that happened was I started, I was being swept off my feet by this guy. I mean, he was at candlelight dinners and roses almost every night, steak dinners and then you get your videos with your country music videos and 
playing all these love songs and looking into your eyes and you're like, you know, you're just taken. So before I knew it, um, I had been swept off my feet to the point that I was compromising my spiritual beliefs, which was I wasn't even divorced from my husband. He convinced me. He said, I know you want to get a divorce. He convinced me to leave with him and move somewhere else, and he was going to help me get my divorce. Well, that was the first thing that we had done. I decided to do that. I knew that being in my daddy's house was a, bur a burden to him. My brother still lived there, and I thought, well, you know, this will give me an opportunity, and I can just get out. So I did, and I, I left. It didn't take long once we got there um, before the abuse started to me. I, had, I was 26 years old. I had never been in a bar in my entire life. Um, just never was my thing. I never did get to go out on my first date till I was like 17. Um, my first movie I went to was with my brothers and my daddy. And um, so, but anyway, we uh, got to the bar and I, we had to drive my car. We had my car was the only vehicle we had. That should have told me something right there in the beginning. But anyway, um, we went out to this bar and uh, I was gonna be the designated driver. His daughter, actually, he had a daughter my age, so he was 20 years older than me, I come to find out later. Um, we went to the bar, and uh, he started drinking liquor, and I was drinking Cokes. And I had never, like I said, I'd never been in a bar before. Um, I began to drink the Cokes, and there was people beginning to ask me to dance. He wanted me to dance with him. I was like, I don't want to dance. I don't know how to dance. And he just kept asking and asking, and I never would dance with him. Well, this other guy came to ask me to dance and um, it was a slow dance I could dance slow I me mean, you know so I kept telling him, no I really don't want to do this I'm not comfortable with this so I did anyway and on my way back to my seat uh, before I got a chance to sit down a slap come across my face I had glasses at the time my glasses flew off my nose um, he began to pull my hair um, and then cuss me and pretty much, and his daughter uh, drug me into the ladies' restroom and she said, my daddy is like this when he's drinking. But she ended up leaving me there with him that night. Well, um, I had a guy come tell me, one of the bartender guys, he said, the only thing I can tell you is, because he kept on wanting me to dance and he just kept getting drunk and drunk and drunk. He said, the only thing I can tell you is to go ahead and just do what he says until he passes out. So this is what I did. So I started off with that pattern of doing exactly what he told me to do in order to keep from getting hit and in order to keep peace. So I danced with him until he passed out. Well, you know, even in your sin, God takes care of you. I was still out there. I was living with a man who was not my husband. Well, here we go. Uh, he's passed out in my car. I know my way, do not know my way at all around this town. So I leave and just pray, God, get me back to the trailer we're living in because I have no idea how to get there. I pulled up and left him in the car. His daughter was in there and she was telling me, she said, Yvonne, she said, you need to take your son and you need to go home. She said, my daddy gets like this when he's drinking. Well, in my mind, you know, um, I'm thinking of all the good little things that he's done, the sweeping me off my feet, you know, and this, that, and the other, the burden that I'm going to be on daddy, you know. The Satan always is in there too, trying to keep you going the wrong direction. So that's what was happening there. So you have the battles of the spirits going on there at the same time. So anyway, um, I'm thinking, you know, I really have done made all these mistakes. I made a mistake with my first husband. I'm, I've done made another mistake here. I quit my job. So it was hard to have to go back. So I stayed. Uh, the abuse to me began to get worse. Uh, there was one time in particular that he did almost kill me. Um, but um, after a little bit I began to after the last time we began this is one of the type guys here too who lift his hands praise the Lord in church and you know uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde he's one way in public but he's another way behind closed doors and a wolf in sheep's clothing if you, if you know what I mean so anyway I'm just going to try to fast forward a little bit I stayed I did go home one time uh, I took my son home um, and that weekend, it's like his mother started calling. She's saying, please come back. You're the best thing that's ever happened to him. You know, he won't ever do it again, da 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 da, da. So anyway, I convinced myself that I'm just going to go down here. I'll leave my son with my mom and my daddy. 
I'm going to go down here and I'm going to just let him know, you know, that I need to get my life straight with the Lord, that I don't need to be living with, he, with you. So this is what I did. I went home and took my son home. And then uh, I went on back. And, um, of course, naturally, he convinced me to stay. Called my daddy and told him, I said, I'm coming home to get my son. And he said, no, you're not. They could already, my daddy already knew I was living. I was going down the wrong road. So my daddy said, no, you're not. And he said, if you try to come back, he said, we're going to have you both arrested. So I'm like, okay, well, this isn't going to work. So during the next few months, I become, started to get very depressed. Living without my son was not the thing that I wanted to do. So I began to get more and more depressed. Um, I found out that I was pregnant. Also, at the same time, I was carrying his child. Uh, so I had began to start trying to protect the life that was inside of me, trying to protect my own life. So I started to withdraw and just become more and more depressed. So mentally, during the time, um, the abuse started to me first, but it kind of escalated a little bit of time. You know, Satan doesn't come in all at once. He comes in a little bit of time. So it began to be like a deceitful thing. You know, I'm going to deceive you. Well, I was being a typical mother. You know, I was trying to teach him how to tie shoes. I was trying to teach him how to do the things a normal mother teaches a child to do. And he's like five years old at the time. And he's like, you need to let me teach him how to do those things. He's going to always be a wimp if you keep on because, you know, you're just te you're doing everything for him. So he started out a little bit at a time trying to show him that, how to tie his shoes. But he'd get a little rough with him, punching him in the arm and things like that. And see, he, and, and Alan would begin to learn how to tie his shoes. It would begin, you know, and the, the, the deceit started like, well, I can see he's improving. But then all of a sudden, I can see that maybe you're getting a little bit rough here. Well, you need to let me be the daddy figure. You need to let me, because he's going to always think that I'm the bad guy. So, I mean, a lot of things start going through people's heads when you're going through this stuff. And um, so anyway, I'm going to try to fast forward. I know I don't have a whole lot of time. But... Um, we had stayed. I went back, and I, I, the more I, the longer I stayed away, uh, the more depressed that I got. And we had a vehicle. We were living. His mom had moved in with us, and I was thinking to myself, I said, I'm going to have to get here, and I got to I got to go home and get my little boy. He was fixing to start school, so I said, I've got to go home. And I knew things had gotten better after Alan was gone. There, um, he was still very verbal abusive. Um, but he, and he threatened to slap me several times during my pregnancy, but uh, things had gotten a little bit better, and I heard his mom make the, the comment, uh, I just wish her little boy would just stay away because things are just so much better when he's not here. And, uh, but I had become more and more depressed, and I, I decided that I was going home, and I began to pray. We had started, we had started I was playing piano for a church, and um, we sang churches, and we went singing churches. We sang gospel music in churches, um, and then still he would drink, and still he would beat me when we got home. Uh, didn't take much. If you've been in an abusive situation before, you realize that it doesn't take much. I mean, I can put milk in the cornbread, and I may get a beating for that. It doesn't take much sometimes to go them off, you know, make them go off. And, um, but anyway, um, I had went there, and uh, I decided I was going to go home, and I started praying. I said, well, Lord, he has to have my car every day. So I said, the only way, the only way that I'm going to get out of here is if somebody <coughs> volunteers to take him to work. Well, all of a sudden there one morning, he comes in and he says, uh, I've got somebody else picking me up for work today. I knew that was my opportunity to get in my car and go home. So that's what I did. I set out, and his mom was telling me, begging me not to go. His daughter, a uh, little daughter, was coming to visit us that week. And... Uh, I knew that it was something that I would not be able to. I did not trust myself to tell him. I wanted, I put it in a letter to him that I was leaving. And I did not trust myself because I knew he would convince me to stay. So I wanted to go while he was gone. I took off, I left. I couldn't drive fast enough. Um, and by the time I made it to Chatham, um, it was about 100 miles. But by the time I made it to Chatham, my car was running seriously hot. And... Um, so I stopped there. I called my mom and I told her, I said, Mom, I'm um, coming home. And um, I said, can you come pick me up? My car is running hot. And she was real excited to see me and know that I'm, I'm coming. So 
Here she comes, she drives over there, my little boy, as soon as he gets out of the car, he just runs to me, jumps in my arms, and hey mama, I missed you, and, and then he takes me, when we go to the house, he takes me, and then here I am, I'm like, you know, don't ask me any questions, you know, about what's going on, don't ask me nothing, daddy and them never asked me a word, they didn't ask me anything. So we go home, my little boy shows me around the house, like I've never been there before. This is where I was raised, and he shows me around the house and showing me his room and, and this, that, and the other. And at this particular time was actually when I had found out that I was pregnant. So I kind of mixed things up a little. But anyway, um, during this particular time, I, I knew that this is where I needed to stay. I needed to be at home with my little boy. Well, all of a sudden, here he comes calling again. And I was praying at the same time, Lord, just make him understand, you know, make him understand that I had to come home. I had to be here with my little boy. I had to get him in school. Just make him understand. Well, all of a sudden, he just began to understand. Well, you know, anytime you're praying, you got to remember one thing. There's more than one person listening to that prayer. Uh, Satan will often bring the answer before God has a chance to answer. So that's what happened with me. He did understand. It was everything was falling into place. But at the same time, I was living outside of the will of God. So everything was falling into place, but it was falling into place according to the devil's plan, not the plan God had for my life. So he started calling me again, wanted me to come back and go back with him. And after he found out that I was pregnant, he came down to visit. And I had already done been before the church, and I apologized and all this. And um, I had told Daddy that morning, I said, I want to go to church. And... Um, he's going to go to church with me, and Daddy's like, no, you don't need to take him to church with you. This is just where my head was. I mean, you know, and that's just kind of crazy to think I'm going to bring this man to my church. And uh, while he was gone, while Daddy was going to church, he started to work on my mind there. You need to come back with me. Uh, you're carrying my baby, and if you don't go back with me, I'll make sure you never see this baby again. Um, Begin with all those threats and this, that, and the other. You need to come on back with me. I'll take care of you and this, that, and the other. All the while, I felt like Peter, later on when I began to realize a lot of things in my life, uh, you know, how Peter denied the Lord three times. Well, uh, I, could, I could feel in my spirit, I could feel, you know, don't go, Yvonne, don't go. Don't go, Yvonne, don't go. And uh, I don't know, for some reason, I got in the car and I decided to go. Uh, took my little boy, we stopped over in Jonesboro. I could hear, don't go, Yvonne, don't go. For some reason I kept driving. One last time, we pulled over because he knew that I was having a problem with, with leaving on to go on this trip. And he said, you need to make up your mind what you're going to do. Either you're going to go with me or you're not. And he said, uh, I promise you, it will be the worst mistake you ever make in your life if you decide to turn around. Well, I believe the threats. You know, lots of times the threats that they make sometimes are not true, but 90% of the time they are true. They will hunt you down. They will find you. And there will be a death of some sort. So anyway, I just kept driving. And meanwhile, my little boy had picked some flowers while we was out there at one of those little stops that we made, and he was going to carry them to my mama. And we started heading the other direction. He said, I got flowers from Emma Angela, which was Chris's mom. He didn't understand. And during that particular time, I had no idea what was going on in my life. No idea what was going on in my mind. No idea what was going on in my head. I was making some stupid, foolish mistakes. And watching my little boy just be taken away from me one little step at a time. And we got back over there. And my, another one of my big dreams was to have a big, big picket fence, you know, the big fenced in yard and, and the whole works, the nice house. Well, I get over here, and he's done bought a house, got a big fenced-in yard, and everything you ever dreamed of, everything you ever dreamed of. But the one thing that I didn't have there was love. I, I did not have love, and I did not have peace of mind. Walked in. Um, I was probably about five months pregnant by the time that this was going on, and went in. His mom's, well, you went brought her back, and this and that and the other. Didn't take long before. First, things were okay. Uh, there was no abuse to Alan. There was not, you know, he was, he would always send him to his room a little bit at a time. I had to, he had to be first. Um, if, if Alan was there, Alan had to go to his room. He could not stay in the same room with me. He didn't want him sitting by me on the couch. He didn't want me having anything to do with, with him. 
And that's the way those people are. They want your full attention. It's all about them. <clears throat> so he would send him to his room, send him to play, um, this, that, and the other. And um, after a little bit, he got comfortable again, and then the abuse started back to me and to Alan. Well, I was still pregnant. I got up in the middle of the night sometimes to check on Alan. He'd say, where are you going? I said, I'm going to get some water. He said, no, you're not. You're going to check on Alan. He'd tell me, you don't need to go out there. You're, um, you're pregnant. You're going to file this, that, and the other. But the abuse then began to start to him and uh, more and more. And it was like I said, it was like one of those little things, punching in the arm, getting a little rough, and then every time that I would say something to him, you know, he'd say, uh, I'm not hurting you, my boy. I'm not hurting you, my boy. And, and just look at me and smile and just deceitfully do these things. And, and Alan say, no, sir. No, sir. And um, Alan began to soil his pants. There again, I, as mother, totally clueless. You know, not even, my mind is not even where it's supposed to be as mother. Um, he began to soil his pants. Uh, I'm still pregnant this time, getting ready to have a baby. And uh, before you know it, and I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward because I know we're, we're on time. If you wanna ask me a question later on, you can. Um, I had Jeremy, actually the day that I had Jeremy, um, he began to, uh, I was in pain. He turned around, you don't slap that frown off your face, I'm gonna slap it off for you. Well, I'm in labor, you know, so naturally to do that. But um, my five week old baby, he was five weeks old at the time of my son's death. Um, he, uh, when, we, when I brought Jeremy home from the hospital, we let Alan just look at him for just a second and then sent him back to his room. He didn't let him have anything to do with him. And uh, he actually picked up Jeremy at five weeks old and dropped him on the bed, um, just dropped him. He was jealous of the fact of my breastfeeding. and he was jealous of the fact of me bonding with him. He would try to make me let him lay there and cry. Um, and this is typical of somebody who's abusive. They want your full attention and, and it didn't matter even when I was pregnant, I could go to the store and I was fooling around with the checkout guy nine months pregnant. Uh, he monitored my phone calls, he watched everything that I did, and if you've been through it, you know that. They watch you, uh, everything you do. His mom would tell him things. He even, he even abused his mom. Um, one Sunday morning, we were getting ready to go to church. And uh, getting ready to go to church, I was the piano player. Jeremy was there, his mom was there. We were getting ready to go to church. Alan soiled his pants. And he said, you use the bathroom, haven't you? And he said, no, sir. And he said, yeah, you have. And he said, well, I'm gonna take him in to take a bath. Well, here I am, I'm, I'm feeding my son, my five-week-old baby, I'm feeding him. He takes him into the bathroom and he's gonna supposedly give him a bath. Well, I'm sitting here on the couch, his mom is sitting here on the other couch over here and I hear a bump and a splash. And I'm like, you know, just in the back of my mind, well, he must have slipped, you know. And then here comes my, husband now we had gotten married here he comes and he's like uh, well my boy's taking a bath and he's talking to me and just smiling and he's having a normal conversation and then he said well let me go check on my boy goes back in there the next thing I see is him setting him down on the floor and him walking into his bedroom but the back of his legs were red and I knew immediately that something was not right and he come in apologizing. He said, baby, I'm sorry. I got the water just a little bit too hot. But he's going to be okay. We're going to wait on Walmart to open up, and we're going to go get some ointment, and he's going to be okay. At that particular time, I was already mentally just gone, but I went into a further state of shock because I knew what has happened here, what's just happened here. Well, he went into his bedroom, and he laid him on his stomach, and... Uh, then now wants to try to take care of him and try to doctor him and try to do this and try to do that and try to feed him, which he had, he had not wanted to do too, with holding the food and, and things like that. So he started trying to take care of him and here I am. I, I had to go under hypnosis to try to remember a lot of things that I blocked out from that day because it was so painful. But um, anyway, he went in, he was trying to take care of him and before I knew it, I had Jeremy by the bed and I was talking to Alan and he was saying, Mama, please don't forget my covers. And he was talking about for next week for school. 
don't forget my colors. And, and he looked at me and, and I could see that he was about to pass out. I had Jeremy in my arms and um, I said, oh my God, Chris, he's about to pass out. And he said, okay, well, we're gonna have to take him to the hospital. He said, but you gotta tell him he slipped and fell in a tub of hot water. Cause if you don't tell him that, they're gonna take him away from you and they're never gonna give him back. So all of a sudden, Alan began to slip away. He began to pass out and I started, I said, I love you, Alan. He said, I love you, mama. And he just mouthed those words as he passed out. We took him to the hospital. I remember holding Jeremy in my arms, sitting in that emergency room, and before I knew it, they came back out and they said, I'm sorry, but he's gone. Um, the doctor could tell that there was foul play involved, so immediately they began to call the police. And um, it, it was like a, a big blur after that. Um, went back to the house, I could see all his toys, and really just didn't realize a lot of what had happened. I was like, what has happened? What, this, what has happened? And I thought, how can I call daddy? And I made him actually call daddy. I said, you're gonna have to call my daddy. And he called daddy, told him he slipped and fell in a tub of hot water. My daddy and my mom came down that weekend. They had a, lot, a little service for him at that church that we were going to. And then we went home to my home, actually where I lived and grew up. And we had the funeral there. Well, one of the one of the lieutenants, my aunt, who went and asked, aren't you gonna arrest him? And he said, oh no, he's all right. He, he won't hurt anybody. He just hurts women and children. They let him go to my son's funeral. He sat actually in front of my daddy and my mama as, as the funeral was going on. We got to the funeral and and my daddy and them were finding out the coroner and the, and the funeral director were showing my daddy and them some of the pictures and they were showing that there was foul play involved, involved in it. And daddy pulled me and my daddy and my brothers pulled me in the Sunday school room afterwards and he said, Yvonne, what happened? I'm like, nothing, daddy. Yvonne, what happened? Nothing, daddy. He said, Yvonne, baby, all I'm telling you is tell the truth and the truth is set you free. So, and they were contemplating then, all I could think of, the social services had come and gotten Jeremy the day after Alan was murdered because they wanted to make sure that I was not involved in any kind of a way. So they come and picked up Jeremy and took him from me and they said as soon as my name was cleared that they would go ahead and they would be able to uh, give him back to me. Well, I was thinking the whole time, I gotta go get my little boy, I gotta get my baby, I gotta get my baby. Daddy said, baby, we'll take you to get your baby. What you need to do is just put him on the road and send him the other way. And I decided that day that I was gonna go home with my daddy. I was gonna go home with my daddy. And my cousin had had him blocked out there at the church. He wasn't gonna let him leave. And I was hungry, I hadn't had anything to eat. And I said, well, let me just ride with him to Chatham and we'll, we'll talk about it and I'll tell him that I'm gonna go back with, with y'all. And I'm staying here. And on the way over there um, to Chatham, I had told him that I was gonna stay and go home with daddy. He didn't say a word. He was very quiet and didn't say anything. We got over to Chatham and um, as soon as we got there, the police pulled up and they arrested both of us and he came and told me, it was a police officer I'd known for a long time and he said, Yvonne, he said, I'm sorry. He said, I'm gonna have to arrest you. And I said, okay. He said, you wanna call your daddy? And I said, yes, sir. So I did and right there again, daddy, all I'm tell you is tell the truth. To set you free. On the way to the jailhouse, um, they want to know, did you know this man had been arrested for wife abuse? No. Did you know this man had been arrested for child abuse? No. Did you know this man had been arrested uh, and suspected of killing two other children other than yours? No. Didn't take time to get to know that man. Didn't take time to get to know him. I found all this out on the way to the jailhouse. Did you know this, this, and this had happened? Did you know this, this, and this had happened? No, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about what had happened in that bathroom. The only <coughs> thing I knew that was my son's legs were red and that he had been scalded. And what had happened, I found out later, was he had hit him in the head with a screwdriver, placed him in a tub of scalding water, and the blow to the head, and all of that was what had killed him, and, and then the, the water, the hot water. 
didn't know that he had turned up the hot water heater before that point, which said that that was a planned thing that he had planned. You know, they, a lot of those things. But the district attorney uh, had sent word to me, we know you had nothing to do with what happened, and we're willing to work with you if you're willing to cooperate with us. Well, their cooperation meant that I, I was supposed to tell them everything that I saw. Well, I did tell them everything that I saw. They wanted me to say that I saw a lot more than I did. But he was determined to let me know that I'm going to use you as an example as to what happens to women who stay in abusive relationships. Even though I'm not charging you for what you did, I'm charging you for what you didn't do, which was to get out and to act at the time of your son's death. And I was just mentally unable to get out. Um, I was arrested. I was in there for two weeks. And um, they said I needed to go home for counseling. I found a wonderful counselor. Uh, she began to counsel with me. Uh, I almost lost my mind. I had um, one point during the, during the situation that I had um, suicidal thoughts. My mom and I were on the way to visit Jeremy. I was able to go visit him every two weeks after uh, I was out um, while I was going through counseling. I was able to go visit him every two weeks. So this is what I did, and we go visit him. And on the way over there one day, the pain of it all just began to hit me. It, it, I was severely depressed anyway, but I had been, it was like I hated this town, I hated myself, I hated everything about it. And I didn't want to go there anymore. And I said, "What? Well, just let go of the steering wheel and end it all. And um, then all of a sudden I started praying. I said, Lord, I can't, I can't do this. This is hard. I can't do this anymore. And a peace began to come over me, and God just took over, took that from me. But um, we went to visit Jeremy. We had a good visit that day. We went for a couple more years. I was going through my trial. I was going through his trial. I was severely depressed. My mom was going through her own personal pain. My dad was going through his own personal pain. I could not talk to them. Uh, my counselor told me, she said, I want you to write. This is what I want you to do. She said, you write down everything that you feel. And she said, you come back and bring it to me. So I did that. And that's where I started my writing process. It was a lot of therapy for me. I was able to get a lot of stuff out that I just didn't really, couldn't tell anybody. And I tell that story so many times that it made me sick to my stomach. And when I finally got to her, I was like, Lord, please don't let me have to tell the story right now. I just don't want to have to tell it again. And when I walked in the room and I sat down in front of her, she said, Yvonne, how are you handling things now? And I just knew that God had brought her into my life because I said, I don't have to tell it right now. And she said, at some point, you're going to have to tell me what happened. She said, but right now I just want you to take your time and she said we're going to make it through this it's just going to take a little time but I would have little fits screaming fits and this is how God helped me to deal with it just a little bit at a time I get severely depressed over and over and over and I don't be severely depressed and then all of a sudden uh, it just didn't matter where I was it was coming out to scream I'd scream and cry shot stomp my feet I'd pull my hair shake my head and have me a good fit for about 10 minutes 5 or 10 minutes and then I'd feel a little bit better um uh, we went before the sentencing process. They found me guilty of manslaughter. Uh, we had two trials, actually. His trial, he was found guilty of first-degree murder, sentenced to the death penalty. He still sits there today uh, after almost 25 years. The drug discrepancy of killing somebody now because they don't want him to hurt for five minutes is what's holding him up from being executed. Uh, my case has been back on the news. A bunch of times, 20 years ago today, on the front page news of the Shreveport Times. But um, that's where he still sits today. I was very, uh, I guess just I stood there and I was like, wow, when, when they said, uh, I see if I sentence you to 21 years hard labor. Um, and I was like, okay, I shocked again. You know, you're, and here's my mom and my family are all there with me. And um, Mama said, here's your purse. They handcuff shackle me right there in front of my mama and my daddy. And they lead me out of the jail. Uh, during the first two weeks that I had been locked up before, before I went home, <coughs> there were some prison ministers that had came in and they uh, was having a prayer time and I went up before them and they said, God knows that you're his child and, and you know, what we see before us is a broken and bruised woman. And, uh, but God wants you to know that he's looking out for you. Well, here I am in this town that I feel like nobody nobody here cares about me. Nobody loves me. Nobody, nobody wants anything to do with me here in this town. And after I get back here in the prison cell and they get my 
clothes on and all the stuff that I get my uniform and all this. This is maximum security, by the way. Uh, they say I have a visitor, and I'm like, okay. So I go out here, and um, it's one of the ladies that was at the prison thing before, the first two weeks, and she said, I know you feel like nobody likes you in this town. She said, but God sent me here to let you know that there are people here who understand. There are people here who love you, and they are praying for you. And I knew right then, from that point on, that God was going to be with me, that there was nothing in this world that I wasn't going to be able to go through that he wasn't going to carry me through. And I began at that point, I had no idea how long I was going to be in prison. 21 years is a long time for him to stand up there and say. But I started from that point on. I said, I'm going to heal. I'm going to let God have his way, and I'm going to serve him from here on out, and I'm going to do what he wants me to do. Because there's so many things during this time, so many things during my two years that I was at home, it was nothing but God things. There were so many things that he did for me personally that that book talks about that was just God things. There was no way to explain it, no way you could outdo any of it. It was a God, nothing but. And I could not stand up here today. I could not share this story. It is the hardest thing in the world. And people have asked me plenty of times, why do you do that? Why do you go tell all these people this stuff? Why do you stand up there and share something like that? It's not about me. It's not about me. It's about him and what he can do through me. It's about you. It's about every woman every child and every person out here today who has gone through, may be going through this situation right now. And we don't get anywhere in domestic violence unless we share. You have to tell somebody. That's one of the most important things. You have to tell somebody. Get out. Tell somebody. And make sure that you, that you just get to a safe place, and especially if you've got children. Don't let your mind be deceived into thinking you can make that man better because you can't. Women are misfix it. We think we can fix it all, but we can't. There's no way you can fix people. Only God can change a heart, and that heart has to want to be changed before you can change it. So I, I don't know what time it is. I know I'm probably running about 10 minutes. About 10 minutes. <clears throat> but um, we're going to have um, some refreshments downstairs. I'm thankful today that I spent... Only seven and a half years in prison. Um, right from the beginning, I, like I said, God was just with me. Um, I went in there, and I was went in there with an attitude. People were asking me, when are you going home? And I said, any day. Um, my brother was about to get married. I just knew God wasn't going to let me stay in there. And I was like, I'm going home any day. So I go in the prison here. It was 200 women. You have um, 15 women on this side, 15 women on that side. It's like a classroom, kind of like this. You have just a half wall in between it, and there's an officer that sits in, in between the deal, and they sit in between all of you. And uh, there's no bathroom in these, in these little rooms except for the, the trustee dorm. There's a bathroom in there. So you have to be on the bathroom waiting list. So uh, this is a, also a difficult thing. Well, I, right after I got there, I had a lady come around. She said, do you want to go to work in the kitchen? And I'm like, I'm not going to be here long enough to work in the kitchen. She said, okay. So... Uh, and I had another little lady come around. I got back to my dorm and I said, well, Lord, you know if I'm going to be here this long or not. I said, if you want me to work in this kitchen, then send somebody back around and I'll work in the kitchen. One five minutes, here she comes. She said, can you just work till you go home? She worked in the front. She knew the time I was looking at. I wasn't supposed to stay there at that particular jail. I was supposed to go to St. Gabriel because I was a long-term prisoner. Um, but the Lord saw fit. I worked 12, 14 hours every day. Um, they did have paying jobs, but um, my first encounter was a Christian lady in the kitchen. Uh, her name was Miss Beatrice Williams. Uh, she was over 18, and uh, I was on A team. We gather every morning and we pray before we start, and people would come through that serving line. I had to do the kitchen thing, get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I worked in the kitchen for a year. But this lady right here, I had no idea she was going to be uh, the person who was going to be in the spot to take, not take my mom's place, but be there. God put her in my life because he knew I was going to lose my mom. I lost my mom one year after I got locked up. I was able to go to her funeral. Um, God made a way with that. But uh, And later on, they terminated my parental rights. I visited my son for two years, for the whole two years, every two weeks until I went to jail. And after I went to jail, I couldn't see him anymore. 
uh, within the first about four years, they finally terminated my parental rights and they said you cannot have anything else to do with him for the rest of your life uh, until he turns 18. Well, when he, I got out in 2001, um, and when I turned, when he, I knew he was turning 18, uh, I decided to look for him. Uh, I had started my book then, I was in the editing process of my book. They told me I could advertise it on Facebook, so I went to Facebook to kind of look for him. So that's what I did, I went to Facebook, couldn't find him, didn't really know if they had changed his name, didn't know if the same people that had fostered him, adopted him or what, but they did. And he said, look for the adopted mom. I had about to give up. And the guy said, look for the adopted mom. So that's what I did. I looked for the adopted mom. And there it was. Um, I was so excited, I forgot to even go look and see if there's pictures. Um, all I knew is I had found him. And they had changed his name. His name was uh, Dylan Jeremy now. Um, so anyway, um, I sent her a message and I let her know that I wanted to be a part of his life. I was his biological mom and I wanted to be a part of his life. And she said, well, let me ask him and see. I knew this day was coming, let me ask him and see. And he sent me a message and he said, well, he told her, he said, tell her, let's um, just contact me on Facebook and we'll see where it goes from here. We began to chat and he gave me his phone number and, and he said, um, one week later, he said, I told him he was getting ready to go into the military and he was going to basic training. And I said, I'm not gonna put any pressure on this, but I would like to meet you at least one time before you go into basic training. One week later on Monday, uh, he said, so, or on Saturday, he said, so what if I come Monday? And I said, this Monday? He said, yeah. And I said, sure. So he came and he came to visit me and I got to see him again for the first time since he was two years old. Uh, we had a, a nice little visit. Um, he walked away from there. He, he told his uh, sister-in-law, who brought him, and he said, I really like her. He said, me and her can talk. He said, I can talk to her. And he told me that a few times, too. I can talk to you. He said, I really like you. I can talk to you. And we have a relationship now. We talk. Um, we talk uh, almost every day. He just brought my new grandbaby down to visit us this weekend. Um, we're dealing with some challenges on that right now. Obviously, I'm not have never been mom, and so I'm not really grandma. Um, but we're trying to figure out what to call me, but that's all right, I know who I am. And Jesus knows who I am. So I'm leaving that all in the hands of the Lord. And um, I, I appreciate y'all's time today. I appreciate, and if there's anything you wanna ask me, we are moving downstairs. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that y'all have. I appreciate y'all having me. Thank y'all so Thank much. You so much.